Production, the Women's Institute, Memory Matters Day at the Isca Centre, Exeter, Devon, England. Filmed by ADR Films, rolling in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, rolling. I don't mind having a photograph taken because we'll be behind the table, but we're not.
I'm going to start with the boring bits. Um, emergency evacuation. Apparently there's some sound activated thing that if we need to get out, some, something will tell us from the ether. <laughs> um, and our main exit is there at the back, big doors, double doors at the back, straight into the car park. But for people at the front, they can get out here and out the way we came in. So we will all do that in a calm and efficient manner if we have to, but I'm sure we won't. And mobile phones, if I could just ask you please to check that they're off or on silent, that would be good. Okay. Now a lot of interest has been generated in this Memory Matters Day, and you will see various comings and goings throughout the day, which I'm sure is not actually going to disrupt us. The day is being filmed by Adam in the hope that we can get an edited version onto our website so that people that couldn't make it today can have a look at the kind of thing we've been talking about. And there'll be a DVD um, to loan out from County House, if anyone's interested in that. As Jean said, next week is Dementia Awareness Week, and we have Matt Woodley from Radio Devon. He's coming at lunchtime to do a feature on this day and the WI um, working with um, dementia awareness. He may want to wander around and ask um, a few questions. If he approaches you and you're not happy about that or happy about being filmed, please say that's absolutely fine. You don't have to get involved with that side of things and your wishes will be respected. So as you can see from the programme, we've got a very full day planned. I'm going to try and chair it in an efficient, polite manner. <laughs> um, but everyone will be passionate about what they want to talk about, I'm sure. Each of you will have decided to come here for a different reason. But statistically, we know that one in three of us in this room will know someone who has dementia. This is a huge issue for our society and is one that is, of course, predicted to grow. As part, of, as part of the Prime Minister's challenge on dementia, the Women's Institute nationally has committed to supporting efforts to create dementia-friendly communities. With 240 institutes in Devon and over 7,000 members, we are the largest federation in the country. There are over 50 WIs represented here today, and such was the demand for seats that, that unfortunately were 40 people that wanted to come that couldn't come. How many dementia champions have we got here today? Three or four. How many dementia friends? Or purple angels? Okay. That will become a bit more... Um, clear later why I asked those questions. The WI philosophy is about inspiring women and making a difference. And I'm sure that we have both of these things in abundance here today. So this morning we're going to start off in a minute with Dr. Pearson who's going to tell us a bit about what dementia actually is and a little bit about the research trials that are happening in the Southwest Peninsula led by his team. We're then going to hear from three inspirational people who live, who in their own ways are making a real difference to people in Devon living with dementia. The morning will finish with our special star guests, Laurel and Hardy. It's gone out for a fact. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they have, um, they're going to tell us about their work as a, a singing history duo. We'll break for lunch at one. Um, it might be easier, well, those at the back go out that door and those you know, try, try and get some system going, but there's a buffet lunch in there for everyone that's purchased a ticket. The bar will serve drinks um, if you want to buy them, and there'll be more opportunities, obviously, to look around the stalls, ask questions of our speakers, um, all of whom have got stalls. So there probably isn't time for questions as we go along, but that's, that's your opportunity to go up and, and speak to them personally. And of course, at lunchtime, if you haven't bought a raffle ticket yet, that's your chance to do so as well. Then the, that's all local stuff. So this morning is all about what's happening locally. This afternoon, we're going national. And Jerry Colby will be telling us about her work with Rotary Clubs around the country. 
And then Angela Rippon obviously is going to tell us about her work as ambassador for the Alzheimer's Society and lead us in a discussion about how we feel, if we want to, um, that DFWI can get involved with dementia awareness. My personal hope is that we'll be able to turn talk into action and all leave here with something we think we can do, no matter how small, that will make a difference to someone living with dementia. And then we'll finish the day with Jean Usher leading us in an example of a singing for the brain session. Um, right, back to the beginning. Dr. Pearson um, is going to set the scene for the day by telling us about what dementia is and his other work. Thanks, um, thanks very much, Heather. It's, it's, it's great to be here. I hope everyone can hear me all right. If there's any, any difficulties, just, just let me know. So I was going to talk about, um, men, um, about dementia, what it is, and about what treatments and what research is going on. I'm, um, I'm an old age psychiatrist, so I'm based in West Devon, sort of down the, the western end of um, Devon around Plymouth. And I, I work in memory clinics, the regional hunting service and also run a, run a dementia research centre in Plymouth that's open to all patients. Um, so this is a little overview of my talk. Um, and the first thing to talk about is so what dementia is. So I think if you're able to get to this conference you don't have dementia. <laughs> I don't know about everybody here but I got lost about three times. <laughs> so we're all okay. And I guess the, the important thing about dementia is it's not normal ageing, so it's not, it's not just normal forgetfulness. As, as we get older, we all, we all get a little bit forgetful, I'm, myself as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a disease process. Um, this, this, is, this, this is an Alzheimer's Society slide. So the sort of definition of dementia would be um, a progressive decline in more than one domain of cognitive function in clear consciousness. So it has to be more, technically to diagnose dementia, it has to be more than a memory problem. You have to have a, a problem in another domain of um, cognitive function. I'm sure I've got another slide, but um, it'd be around sort of adding up, I'm not able to count the change, difficulty finding words perhaps. There's a whole, I mean the brain is very complicated, there's a whole lot of sort of cognitive functions. So it may, maybe you notice that someone can't do the washing up, not able to put the dishes away, and that, that's all slowly, slowly progressing. Um, and it's really important to differentiate that from normal aging, that we, we don't sort of medicalize normal aging. And it's always a difficulty, but there's a term used of, of MCI, or mild cognitive impairment, which isn't a diagnosis, it's a more a descriptor. And I, I tend not to use it, because I don't find it terribly helpful, because that overlaps with sort of normal, normal forget. So if someone's got forgetfulness, and it's not sure whether it's normal aging or a disease. And, and ultimately, the, I mean, there's lots of, there's lots of cognitive tests that we do, so we ask lots of memory questions in a structured form. We do more detailed testing. We do scanning techniques and sort of review things. And ultimately, we sort of follow patients up to, to see whether there's progression or not. Um, okay. So, and the dementia's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because at the moment, we're in this sort of, um, almost like a revolution, really, as a, a, there's a sort of transformation going on in the, the sort of world and the wider society around us, all from the sort of ageing society. And so dementia used to be really quite uncommon, and now it's becoming much commoner. And it's commoner because of the because of the ageing population. I've got some figures around that. But the word the word dementia is very difficult. So it's from the Latin sort of dementis, so without mind. And so clearly, someone in the early stages of dementia. Is not without mind. They've got some memory problems and some other problems. I have to say, it's a bit. It does feel a bit like cancer in the 1970s. Dementia is getting a, a lot easier word to use, and, and hasn't got the sort of terror that's being associated with it. That's the thing about dementia friends, and sort of it's spreading, spreading the word, and so people understand rather than fear the illness. Um, apparently, it's the of people over the age of 50, the most feared illness is is dementia. Not, not cancer anymore. And that, that, that's why there's all this political movement 
to, to do something about it and to sort of enable care and the challenge that's going to face a sort of healthcare system and care system from, from the scale of the problem of dementia. Um, so m most dementias do normally present with forgetfulness, and particularly Alzheimer's, it's like a, a very slow progression in, in severity, and usually going back from the most recent memories, going back in, in time. And again, this is an Alzheimer's Society slide, just around some of the other cognitive functions that can be affected. So not being able to follow um, serials on television, um, forgetting, forgetting names of sort of family and friends of important, important bits you wouldn't expect people to forget. Um, feeling anxious and depressed. So depression is quite common early on in dementia. It's sort of quite helpful to have um, psychiatrists involved in dementia assessment. It's rather historical, and a lot of Europe, I mean, neurologists and geriatricians do dementia assessment, and there's a, there's a role for all of us, but anxiety, depression is common, and these recognising and treatments, treating sometimes. So the, these are the different types of dementia. So these, these are for dementias that present over the age of 65. The dementias that present below the age of um, 65 are slightly different. They're sort of inherited patterns, and they're, mu they're much, un much less common. There's usually delayed presentations, and they, they normally present to um, neurologists. And there are, there are lots of potentially treatable causes of dementia as well, some vascular sorts of um, options. But we don't need to worry too much about that. They're very, they're very small. So the, the, biggest, the biggest dementia is Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease and dementia are sometimes used interchangeably. So Alzheimer's disease is a dementia, but there are other dementias. Um, vascular dementia is about 20%. There's a thing called Louis Louis dementia, and frontotemporal dementia is about 5%. They, they're, they're, un, they're uncommon, but they cause difficulties when they do present. Um, so how common is dementia? So the problem, of course, is the ageing population. So as we get over the age of 65, the, the incidence of dementia increases quite dramatically. So at 65, the incidence is 5%, so 1 in 20, and at 80, it's 1 in 5, 20%. And then because people are now living longer, there's relatively more people over the age of 80, two in three, two in three of all people with dementia are aged 80 and over. So it's really a problem from a sort of political and societal viewpoint of, of really older people over the age of 80 who often have a lot, a lot of other comorbidities. So they have other, other sort of long-term conditions, maybe like Parkinson's disease, so other, other causes of care, and then the dementia comes on top of that basically increases their, their care burden. Uh, so I'll just run through the dementias themselves. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It's, it's the eponymous disease with Alzheimer's because it has um, neurofibrillary tangles and plaques in the brain. So it's an identifiable disease. And this is why most of the research has gone on with Alzheimer's because it's um, you're able to sort of diagnose the condition separately, although diagnosing the condition, I have to say, in patients, it's, it's quite difficult to be certain early on. And there's a lot of endeavour around increased sort of scanning techniques, so more complex scans, so like amyloid PET scans and um, tau PET scans are being developed. They're not freely available at the moment, but the research companies are increasingly looking towards them to be certain of the diagnosis of the patients who are entering the trials. And there's increasing awareness of some of the results in the previous trials have been that patients haven't been recruited to trials with pure Alzheimer's disease. So with Alzheimer's disease, it's typically the, the short-term memory that's affected. So it's a bit like the tide coming in, a problem happens, and you suddenly realize water's up over your ankles. And it's a sort of thing where, you know, we all lose our car keys, but suddenly you lose your car. And it's that sort of scale of difference, really. There's some, there's some, some sort of problem emerges, and then everyone realizes that there's quite a big sort of insidious onset that um, sort of catches people out. I mean, people always ask about risk factors. Um, the family history of, of Alzheimer's disease, it, I mean, is, is significant, but it's very, very small. So because the dementia is so common in people over the age of 65, the um, genetic sort of risk factor is about 3%. So it's very, very small. You can't ignore it, but it is there. And increasingly, it's becoming clear that a risk factor at a population level for um, dementia is vascular risk factors. So it doesn't, it doesn't say that um, 
the you, you as an individual smoke, have diabetes, drink excess alcohol, you get dementia for sure, and it will increase your risks a lot. And so, there are, there are wide, so smoking in the wider population will increase the overall incidence of dementia. And there was a, an interesting paper by Carol Brain, who's a, a public health consultant in Cambridge. We did a cohort study 10 years ago looking at um, the incidence of dementia in a cohort of patients, and she followed that cohort up 10 years later, matching them as close as she could together. And she found that the, increase, the expected increase in dementia from the aging population was less. It caused a bit of a controversial stir, but she postulated that that's because GPs are managing vascular risk better. So they're treating people with um, statins for race, cholesterol, managing their smoking. So, so there's a sort of public health component. So it's clearly important that we're, to, to do something about dementia is probably keeping fit and all those sensible things, plenty, eating plenty of fruit and vegetables, getting out and cycling, all of those things. So the, the whole thing about getting the population mobile, cycling to work rather than driving. Better for environment, better for us. Okay, um, that, that's, a, that's a section through the brain of someone with Alzheimer's disease. So the affected brain is on the right, and that's a normal brain on the left. So you can see the growth shrinkage, and this would be later in the disease when there are significant problems. Early on in the disease, there could be particular areas of the brain that are affected. This is um, Lois Alzheimer, who was a German neurologist that the disease is named after, and he identified the um, amyloid plaques and the tau tangles from silver silver nitrate stain that had been brought in in the early um, 1900s. And because it was a pure disease, his name was stuck. Pick, pick discovered, pick conclusion bodies, but they weren't um, they weren't readily uh, identifiable by staining. And, and frontal temporal dementia is much more complicated, so Pick's disease is no longer used for frontal temporal dementia. And um, that's another, um, that's, a, that's a section of the brain at a microscopic level. So there are, there are amyloid plaques at the top here, at the top, and these are, these are the tau tangles scattered throughout the brain. That's what you see at a cellular level, because it's very hard to see. And part of the challenge of dementia research is it's so hard to see in cells. So if, if someone has cancer, you take the tumor out and you can look at it. But with someone with dementia, you really can't look at their brain. It's impossible. You don't do brain biopsies, and scans are only sort of a millimeter slices at best. You can't see the cellular level going on. And again, that's just there's an amyloid plaque down on the bottom there, and a beautiful little tangle on the right. Uh, and that's a, again showing amyloid stain. This is amyloid stain in the brain. There's an amyloid plaque at the top, and this is some amyloid infiltration in the, in the capillaries. Amyloid is quite a common disorder in humans um, associated with autoimmune disorders. So it's, a, and it's teasing out the relationship of amyloid in the disease process. Amyloid is present in the normal um, human brain. It clearly has a role in all of us. And as we get older, some people, it, it's, metabolism gets affected. It's probably involved within maintaining infection in the brain, keeping, keeping the brain clean. But, uh, but it's still not really known what the role of amyloid is. So there's lots of uncertainties. So with vascular dementia, about like 20% of um, dementia is over the age of 65. The second most common form of dementia and it's caused, dam it's caused by damage to blood vessels in the brain. There can be a stepwise deterioration. It used to be called multi-infarct dementia in the past. And it's quite clear that vascular dementia is a syndrome of different illnesses within, within the umbrella term. So some people do still have a stepwise deterioration, like some of the mini strokes. The risk of dementia after a stroke is significantly increased. And so some people, and a third of people after a stroke will go on and develop a sort of form of vascular dementia. That's an interesting question. So why do some people develop a dementia and why don't others? Um, in general terms, risk factors are things like high blood pressure and cholesterol, so it's clearly important to try and control those. But there's, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that that alters the disease progression, but intuitively it makes sense to do that. Uh, Louis body dementias, which are about 20% of dementias, we don't see so many in practice, so a lot of them are clearly going unhidden. And Newcastle is the big centre where they sort of researched into Louis Body Dementia. So they looked at they looked at a lot of people's brains in great detail and found Louis Body Dementia was present in 20% of people. So typically presents with fluctuating cognition and visual hallucinations, which are early on very well formed. Um, there's a fault in sensitivity to medication and there's an overlap with Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism. We, we clearly can see the patients with visual hallucinations. 
and the other patients will be around and not presenting. So it's, it's always good to be cautious about um, medications. And if people are sensitive, it just makes you think about the um, Lewy body of nature. There's um, a couple of Lewy bodies that were described by uh, Fred Cotelli <coughs> back in the, again, the early 1990s. Again, a German, there was a big, big century of German for neurology research back at the beginning of the last century. So I'll just briefly mention frontal lobe dementias. Um, just a, well, they're, they're a small percent, but they, they, it's a gradually progressive condition. The frontal lobe is 60% of our human brain. So it's, it's a large amount of the brain. So these dementias present in a variety of ways, but usually with behavioral mm. disturbance, mm. and patients are often in silence. And it's very, very difficult to, to manage that, and very difficult for carers as well. Difficult to make the diagnosis early on because it's steadily progressing, and very difficult to differentiate from, from sort of clinical depression sometimes. It can present with apathy and people do that, so there's usually a history of behavioural change. And they can be quite disinhibited in their behaviours at times. So, so, in, so we, we um, diagnose patients in memory clinics, so GPs are referred in to us, so we'll take a history from the care of patients separately, um, do a form of cognitive testing, usually a brain scan, and then try and bring the diagnosis all together. We may need further scanning, or further cognitive testing, and then talk about the, 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 there are three main things that patients want. They want to know what's wrong with them. They want a diagnosis. They want to know what, what supports are available for them. And that's part of the meeting here you'll hear about the increasing growing amount of support that's available. It's really meaningful, important to carers, probably more carers than the patients themselves. And the whole drive from David Cameron's Prime Ministerial Challenge is to support carers and enable to care to, care to have them at home, keep people at home in their own environments. <coughs> the, the, role of, um, the role of diagnosis is Alzheimer's disease, um, uh, the role of drugs. There are some cholesterol inhibitors that uh, are not disease modifying and are, are perhaps of limited benefit, although very meaningful to some patients, the, the outcome from them. And because of the other, the other <coughs> thing that the patients really want to know about is to know about research, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing in um, these are these are the current cholinesterase inhibitor drugs that you may hear about. You may hear patients, you know, carers, patient, patients saying the same names as dinetazone, gazaracept, galantamine, um, which is Remenil, and rebastigmine, which is Exelon. Um, they're not disease modifying. They don't really improve the memory, but they can sometimes increase patients' motivation, make them uh, more talkative, more chatty, which can be really meaningful. So there's one um, one patient I remember. That her husband said how she was able to talk on the phone when her son rang, which is, which is great. But I, but I think you know, overall it's about half of people who respond to them, and there are some side effects with them, mainly, mainly around nausea and GI upset. So this was the, uh, this is the UK population, sort of the, I find this the most helpful way of demonstrating the aging effect of the population. So this is in the mid 2000, 2009, UK population 62 million. And in previous societies, the population um, spread was always like a pyramid. So with, with lots of young, lots of children, young young adults tapering off, um, and not people not really living much older than 45. Would be, again, in the 1900s, the turn of the century. And as 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 we've sort of progressed in society with public health measures, uh, mainly mainly fresh running water and sanitation, people are now dying less of infections and living longer. So it's becoming more like a cylinder. And this little uh, rock here are the baby boomers now going up into retirement, sort of heading away. And, and it's th this, this cylinder is going to carry on going straight up. So a, so a person retiring now at the age of 65, and what's interesting, the life expectancy of males and females is coming together. So before, females used to spend a lot longer, still about two or three years, but males are sort of catching up. So that's only fair. <laughs> and so the life expectancy of, 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 a, of someone at the age of 65 is, is in, the, in their high eight, in their mid 80s, 83, 84 years. And then, and there's this change you will all be aware of of people now not being old and retiring, of retiring and going on to do other things, of spending the children's inheritance, and maybe settling down when they're 80. And I think even at 80, they don't. Don't really see themselves as 
old anymore, so the whole old words sort of gone out the window. <coughs> Fascinating. <laughs> so, so sort of a, it's an amazing success story, because with that has come a sort of burden of, um, and, and the, what's exercising the politicians are the pensions that are going to have to be paid to all the people living on there, and the fact that there's relatively less people working to pay taxes to support pensions and the health care <coughs> This is just about the size of the challenge, so about, about the growth of numbers. So I've got about five minutes, I think. So I'll just talk about the research that I'm doing on the peninsula. So we're based at um, Plymouth Science Park, which is next to Derrick Hospital. And I work in a, it's an NIHR sort of funded team. So that's a big part of the NHS, the National Institute for Health Research. And it's been a big trust again. It was, well, it was really the Labour government that's been carried on by the Conservative government to embed research the NHS. So the NHS should be a research and an organisation. So a patient anywhere within the healthcare system can access world-class trials. That's the sort of aim of the NHR. It's about 1.3 billion pounds spent. So it's the largest organisation spending on research in the world. And so there's a tremendous opportunity for sort of UK PLC to capture a research market to develop new drugs to help to grow the economy and also to benefit patients within the so that's really how I've been able to do research. So I've been funded through the NIHR to release me from my clinical time and deliver these, deliver these portfolio trials. I'm also involved in some, some more local trials. And I'll tell you a bit about a cognitive assessment tool we're developing. And there's a, team, there's a team of nurses and psychologists within the group that I work, um, all helping to deliver the trials. So at the moment, we have, um, we have a variety of um, Alzheimer's disease trials open. And the trials, interestingly, are all moving to mild and early disease. And I think there's, the, the pharma companies are now much more optimistic about finding a disease-modifying drug, but it's probably going to be a drug that arrests the course of the disease. It's probably, I think on balance, we think it's unlikely we're going to um, put the disease course backwards. So because you want to get people really early, they may be, and this is where it starts to be difficult, before people are symptomatic. So you can arrest the disease where it is. And then there's whole issues there about diagnosing a disease that's not potentially treatable. And I think if you explain that to patients, they sort of kind of can't understand all of that. So, so we have two, we have two or two, actually three um, Alzheimer's disease trials open at the moment. And we've got five trials starting in the autumn. So we've suddenly become very successful at delivering these trials. And so anyone, anyone can take part the diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's disease. So we'll take referrals from, from anywhere and anyone. You usually come through the memory clinics and the special services. And they're just some of the companies that we're working with. Because we also deliver academic trials. So there's a lot of money invested from the Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Research UK, although they're more to the laboratory, but they'll also look at um, clinical delivery, clinical assessment tools. And again, from a lot of the uh, NHR funding organisations. Uh, so there's a there's an affect trial we've been awarded. So this this is a trial in vascular dementia. So it's the first trial I remember in vascular dementia for a long time, and we're probably going to be selected for radar, which is a study coming out of um, Bristol. Again, looking at vascular dementia, sort of mild to moderate severity. And interestingly, these, these trials are using antihypertensive drugs that are already freely prescribed. So the, these are not sort of trials of new drugs trials of present drugs to see whether they're effective. So you can be much more reassuring to patients about potential side effects and risks. The research trials are doing the phase two and phase three trials are sort of early on in the drug development and it needs lots of monitoring. And patients need to be reasonably fit and well so to have no, no sort of unstable illnesses. And you need to have to have regular ECGs and, and blood, trade, blood tests. There's also a trial um, we recruitment to brains for dementia. So um, very keen to have patients who want to donate their brains after their death to try and investigate further and understand the illness and also for, for controls as well. So that can be through any, any sort of special service for the group to that. And then the final, this is my final couple of slides. A project, um, there are various projects I'm involved with. One particularly is that we're very excited about. So I'm involved with um, collaborating with Rupert Nolan Craig Newman, who are neuropsychologists in, um, in Derriford Hospital, to develop a device called the ACE Mobile, which is um, uh, yeah, a couple of 
slides there, which is a, it's based on an iPad, and it's a standard cognitive assessment tool that we use in the memory clinic called the A3. That John Hodges developed the A3, and he's, he's happy for us to transfer this to, a, to an iPad, which we think, which we should, which we think will be much better for test delivery. So it'll be timed, it'll be prompted, it'll be standardised. Um, as you go through the um, iPad, it scores all the domains up to the end, you get that score and an interpretation. And we think this is the beginning, well, it is the beginning of a variety of assessment tools and developing better, better assessment tools. And by using, um, by using an iPad, the patients don't have to, you, you, the, the questions are prompted, although patients are actually quite good at using um, iPads and uh, new, new tools. And we can, by using a, an electronic device, we can capture other domains of cognition that we're not able to capture. And I, I'm particularly interested in practice. So there's um, this ideation of practice where you move your hand out and move it around. And there's some evidence controlled. There's some evidence of that's impaired in early Alzheimer's. So if we can find early markers of disease that are relatively non-invasive and easy to test, it would be quite revolutionary. So we're looking forward to developing all, all those sort of ideas down in, down in Deliveries. And that's the end of my talk. So that's, that's who I am, where we're based, and my email address and contact details. Ruth Newman's with me today, one of my researchers, and we've got a stand. So there are leaflets there, and I'll come to the stand at lunchtime if there's any questions anyone would like to ask. Um, she said everything I was going to say, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning. I'm, I'm David Light. I'm here today to talk about how all of us can make a difference. Uh, I, I'll apologize before I start, because this is only the second time that I've ever done a speech like this. So if I stumble, please go with me. So it's the importance of caring for carers and providing effective information and, and support services. <coughs> right, so history. How I got involved. Well, in 2007, I knew nothing at all about dementia. Then in February of that year, my wife Pam had a stroke. Pam was diagnosed with dementia. 
and then celebrate with our trip to wedding anniversary in the day room of the George Earl Hospital in Torquay. I was then on a fast learning curve. I attended carers meetings which were set up by the mental health teams in Newton Abbott. Questions were being asked, what is attendance allowance, a group address, etc. So I listed all the questions down on a full scout sheet of paper, sat next to Jim Bell and at a, 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 the meeting uh, and put the questions to him. We decided that we would then start and set up the Dementia Carers Pathway, which was information for carers, which we did. Uh, and that is how the Dementia Carers Pathways was born. Devon Partnership NHS Trust used the Dementia Carers Pathways as their information for a national dementia strategy. And our pathways answers most of the questions asked by the, our carers in a way that they can understand. Dementia advisors and the mental health teams use it as their Bible do not leave the office without a pathway in their briefcase. It is also now put on the wards of hospitals with their dementia in their dementia in information pack. We produce the pathways for Devon, Somerset, Wiltshire, the Bradford Teaching Hospital use it in their teaching program, and we've actually printed over 30,000 copies of the dementia care. We've also produced um, a, a, a CD uh, and songbook because singing is so essential in helping people with dementia. But when Pam was in the nursing home, an old lady used to come in, lift a little piano, play 16 tunes, close the lid, walk out again. Everybody, they brought everybody down to the lounge, everybody with dementia joined in with the singing or tapped their foot to the music. It was stimulating their brain. We originally we actually produced a, a hymns and song book, a hymns and Christmas carols I should say. And afterwards the coordinator put the C D into their player of the uh, and, and walked out of the room. When she came back hymns were playing, and there was a resident, Harold, who had never heard his voice, and he was actually reciting the Lord's Prayer to the CD. So it, 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 it was very satisfying for them. That was part of our book. As time goes on, um, someone with a care more and more isolated and it, the caring actually becomes 24 hours, 7 days a week. Where to get information in your area? That is where our pathways come in. And most of the information is in the pathways that the carer wants. Women support services are vital to the health and well-being of the care and the care for. Out of hours, emergency duty team, respite care, as the care slowly sinks, as we do. Sitting service, the memory cafe, domiciliary care, legal advice, lots of things are in the book. What is a memory clinic? There's a difference. Memory clinic is a venue where a full medical assessment of the mental health of the person will take place under the auspices of a qualified consultant and his or her mental health team. The memory cafe provides a place where any member of the public who feels they, that they or a person they know may have a short-term memory problem. They can drop in without an appointment Talk to a member of the mental health team or an experienced volunteer. Meet other carers, get peer support, have tea, coffee, biscuits, obtain information, 
warm friendship, have a sing-along, play games, have a pampering session, which is very, very popular, and also access a memory box. In 2005, Devon's first memory cafe was actually set up in Torquay by a carer, Jim Bell. Jenny Richards, the strategic commissioning manager, or a people mental health remit, was to set up 27 memory cafes in every seaside and market town in Devon, excluding Torquay and Plymouth. Jenny had a budget over three years of a thousand. £750 in the first year, £500 in the second, £500 in the third. After three years, the cafe was to be self-funding. In Jennifer's area of Devon, there are 11. I, I was asked by two ladies to set up memory cafes in Timmouth and Newton Abbott. Set them up in four months, and then went to Jen and then Jen went to Jenny and offered to set up the rest, just paying my travelling expenses, which I did. And Devon now has 47 memory cafes. Jenny and I organised free training for for volunteers in the cafe, and in, in the training is so popular that one lady tried to book in for the third time. <laughs> I would set up a me, me um, that Jenny would email me a town, a person's name, and a phone number, which Heather referred to. I would, I would set up a meeting with him or her, then set up a steering group involving grocery clubs, uh, town councillors, mental health teams, etc. And a date would be set every four months. I would then email Jenny back and say, memory can't be told then. Jenny sat opposite me at one meeting group, we attended, and at the meeting, out come the diaries, as they do. I said, put your diaries away, this is the meeting, also at the next meeting, Leave your hat outside and attend as a volunteer for a memory cafe. It didn't go down very well with some people, but at the end of the day, they turned around and said, that was right. And after the meeting, Jenny said to me, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> and I said, she said, if I said that, I would get the sack. I said, well, you can't sack me because I don't work for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> At another meeting, I, I was, uh, the, the, um, where are we? <laughs> At another meeting, I was there and said that they needed four things. A steering group, suitable premises, volunteers, and cash. We were all sat around the table except the two ladies were sat back in the corner. Up pipes one of them, you won't get volunteers, you won't get cash, and she went on and on and on. <laughs> At the end of it, it was decided to set a memory cafe up, and afterwards, Tony, who was the person that asked me to attend the meeting, spoke to him and I said, are you happy, Tony? I said, good. Those two ladies at the back, they don't know what they're talking about. You'll get volunteers, you'll get money. As a matter of fact, David, that happens to be my wife. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right, he's still talking to me. Right, the, the, um, there are organisations in Devon. Um, the, the partnership is aimed at engaging various local initiatives and enabling them to have a hub in order to raise profiles around networking and other groups of organisation. The partnership, the executive group, consists of public commissioners, etc., private providers, 
the voluntary sector um, and, and making a dementia-friendly community is one of the things that the partnership is involved in. And they also train people actually working in retirement. to the Devon and to the DFWI, whatever that is. <laughs> right. G G uh, Heather's already asked a question. Do you know what a memory cafe is? Do you attend a memory cafe? So, is there a memory cafe in your neighborhood or locality? Find out by visiting the Memory Cafe website, which we'll show you later. If there is one, go out and support it. How? By volunteering, giving your time, or by sorting, sorting the Memory Cafe with cash. <coughs> Hospital staff in Cornwall, Devon, Somerset have either started or are looking to set up a Memory Cafe in their hospital. that on your chair. This is my challenge to you. Right, take your leaflet, write the name of where you live on the top, on the line, and then visit the Memory Cafe website to see if there's a Memory Cafe in your area. Have you heard the saying, plant an acorn to get an oak tree? Mm -hmm. So, go on then ladies, pick your acorn, a Memory Cafe. Plant your acorn, feed your acorn, time or money. Watch it grow. I will guarantee that you will be proud of your gardening. Every one of us has a memory of our family or knows someone with dementia. Is there a memory cafe in your town? Write it on the top of your oak challenge, reminding you to do it. Do not think about it. Go out and do it. And yes, all of us can then make a difference. That is a list of our contacts. Have I got any more time, Heather? No? <laughs> <laughs>
explain why I passionately believe in creating a dementia-friendly generation. Throughout the project, I've had just one aim, just one measure of success, and it's this. For me, this encapsulates the very essence of what makes a dementia-friendly community. It's all about seeing the person with dementia and everything that makes them who they are. It's not about just focusing on the illness and the things that they can't do. Sadly, I can't take any credit for coming up with this wonderful, powerful illustration myself. You may recognise it as the, uh, the work of the late Tom Kitwood, who's a real kind of pioneer of person-centred care. For these three words, the person with dementia, this message of seeing, knowing and understanding the person behind the illness, was what my number one aim was. That's what I wanted the young people to walk away with. I will find out if I succeeded later on in this presentation. So I believe this message really is the number one determining factor in, redu in reducing stigma surrounding dementia. And actually it's all about seeing what people's lives have been like, their hobbies, their interests, their passions. Not focusing on the diagnosis, the illness, the progression, and seeing someone as some total of their problems. And as, as I will go on to say, the project created lots of opportunities to do just that. For the generation to interact together, to take part in meaningful and beneficial activities, and to have fun together. So why else do I passionately believe in creating a dementia-friendly generation? Well, it's been sung by Whitney Houston, and it's been said by our very own Norms McNamara in the forwards of, of a book I've just written. So it's good enough for Whitney and Norms, it's definitely good enough for me. Um, the next line of the Whitney song, the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. So in what ways can children help to lead the way in creating a dementia-friendly community? How can younger people actually help? How can it work across the generations? So firstly, for me, the number one step in, re in reducing stigma is to actually increase knowledge and understanding. And as part of the project, one of the things I did is I went into the college and delivered the dementia awareness session, the dementia friend session, to, the, um, to a group of students. This wasn't rocket science, it wasn't brain science, it wasn't about all the technicalities behind dementia. But it was about five key things for them to walk away with. Things like dementia doesn't just affect older people. And these, this was really the foundation for the interactions, the friendships that they developed with the, uh, with the older people throughout the project. So secondly, the key way that um, children can help in leading the way in creating a dementia-friendly generation is through empathy and emotional reactions. An important lesson that the students learned was actually to do not kind of jump to conclusions. And what had particular resonance with a lot of the students was the real life example that I delivered as part of the training. So for example, there was a story um, about an older lady in a care home who would tap incessantly on the tables all day long. And it drove the other residents and the staff mad. People had no idea why she did it. Her niece came over to visit from Australia. And the staff asked, you know, why is it she does this in incessant tapping all day long? Anyway, it came out in conversation that during the war, she was a code breaker at Bletchley. And what she was actually doing, she was tapping out Morse codes on the table. And that one thing, suddenly she was treated like a celebrity. Suddenly she was seen as a person with a story, having achieved amazing things in her life. The local scout group came along and, and, and sort of intercepted her, her Morse code. The local paper came along. Um, and, and interviewed her about, about what it was like. And it just goes to show the importance of really seeing that person behind the dementia and how she got her self-identity back then. So practical support. Um, I'm sorry, being, being there, the next point I was going to, going to come along to. So, and that's really important. We know that 38% of people with dementia say they feel lonely. 29% say they only see their family members once a week. Okay, of course, we're living in a very different world nowadays. In the 1950s and 60s, a third to a half of households had the generations living together. That doesn't happen anymore. But I think also it's very sad and true to say that sometimes when you get a diagnosis of dementia within the family, it can drive family members apart. Parents or other people, rightly or wrongly, think that they should somehow protect their children from dementia for fear of it upsetting them. When that so isn't the case. And with doing this intergenerational project, I really wanted those younger people to be instigators and in making contact with their grandparents and caring for people and family friends that have dementia. 
because there's so much sort of practical support and things that can be done. A big part of what we did through the project is we organised lots of different and fun activities. As I go on to say, we played old-fashioned games, we reminisced, um, you know, all sorts of things like that. And there's so much that the younger generation can do in terms of that practical support to, to kind of give those moments of joy, to enable the person to be the person. But for me, it's not just about creating one dementia-friendly generation. It's about actually spreading that compassion, that kindness, the things that you can actually